one in. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Mark Neville Artist Talk with TPG curator. Oh, shoot, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Thank you for joining us. It's early evening here in London, and my name is Louisa Ulliette, and I am curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. We're delighted to be here with Mark Neville, one of this year's Deutsche Borsa Photography Foundation Prize nominees. He's with us today to talk through his work, particularly Parade, particularly Parade, uh, the publication for which he was shortlisted. He will present for roughly 45 minutes. And after that, we will move to questions and comments from you and from my colleague, senior curator, Anna Daneman, who curated this year's exhibition. The event should last roughly one hour. Please note that we are recording this so if you, so if you wish, um, don't wish to be featured, please turn off your camera. During the discussion at the end, you can either send through your questions to Anna via the chat feature, or you can raise your hand using the function here on Zoom and we will unmute you so you can speak. We are approaching this event in the same way we do all of our public programs, which is with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect. So please keep that in mind. I hope today's discussion inspires you and we look forward to seeing you again here during some of our other planned online activities and even more hopefully in person again in the gallery. And now to Mark Neville. Hello, um, thank you Louisa for that kind introduction and a big thank you to both you and Anna at the Photographer's Gallery for making this happen on this extremely strange uh, day and period of our lives. Um, I'm talking to you from my uh, uh, studio and home in East London near Old Street. And um, I'm gonna talk through four projects. Um, one which was essentially my first photographic project called Port Glasgow and then two of my projects, which have been about war and conflict and um, finish up with talking about parade. So normally I would take in much more than four projects. Um, so I only got 45 minutes, so I'm gonna jump in um, and I'm gonna share a presentation with you on, uh, on Keynote, so hopefully you will start to see a window with my presentation on. And also me at the side talking. Is that okay? Okay, so my first uh, encounter with making a photographic book was this. It's called the Port Glasgow Book Project. And uh, I was about 35 and I'd been a, <clears throat> a struggling artist since I was about 20. And um, I was getting fed up really of doing work for the art world and not having a kind of voice or a visibility within it. So I decided to do a public art project. I applied for a competition on the west coast of Scotland asking for a public art project. And instead of making a public sculpture, like a bronze sculpture of some uh, politician from a bygone age, which would be in the center of the town, I wanted to make a kind of symbolic gift for the community. So there's about 8,000 homes in Port Glasgow. It used to be the world center for shipbuilding 50 years ago. And now because of the economy and the decline in shipbuilding and the steel industry, it's now a small town on its knees financially, but it still holds on to a very strong Scottish working class identity. Um, and this incredible legacy of shipbuilding. So this is Ferguson's shipyard, which used to be, um, yeah, the number one, one of the number one producers of ships in Britain uh, 50 years ago. Um, this is the first picture in the book, Port Glasgow, um, and it's a kind of metaphor for the town. So it's kind of damaged, but also beautiful. This particular picture um, was bought by the National Galleries of Scotland, I think, and I tried to get them to turn it into their Christmas card, but for some reason they weren't into that. Can't think why. Um, I was interested in that project and thinking about ways in which I could critique uh, the whole form of the social documentary book. So this was a little excursion into those ideas. So this is taken in a pub 
um, and it features uh, hats worn by locals. And I got a friend of mine, a fashion designer, to design these bonnets. And they're kind of based on a like, kind of 1920s style flapper girl bonnet, but also something a little bit futuristic. <clears throat> and the idea was that people looking at these pictures of girls in this book, Port Glasgow would go, oh my God, look at the hats that they used to wear in Port Glasgow in 2003. And it would be a complete lie. So it was really about, the whole book was about testing notions of veracity within social documentary practice. Some of the images in the book are more like kind of fashion or editorial like this. Others are quite staged. Um, others are more kind of like fly on the wall. So this is Donna at the ancient order of the social club. And one of the many interesting things about Port Glasgow is they have a very strong Protestant community and a very strong Catholic community. And um, there is quite a lot of sectarian tension there as a result. So whilst I was photographing this, there were quite a lot of sectarian songs being chanted and sung. Um, some of the images have their lighting based on famous paintings. So this is Joseph Wright of Derby uh, painting, and this is my kind of interpretation of it at a, at a wedding. St. Francis Social Club. Uh, Bonnie Baby competition. And I guess the best known images in the book are these, which are taken at Port Glasgow Town Hall. And uh, as you can see at the top, I've actually installed flashlights in the rigging huge soft boxes and um, whenever I would take a picture the flash on my camera would activate all the flashes in the ceiling in the rigging of this town hall and so I knew I could get a great depth of field right from Betty who's at the front of the image here to someone right at the back of the hall 20 meters away so as I say six enormous flash boxes like this big soft boxes were installed in the rigging of this club. The only problem was that uh, I hadn't really learned about triggers then. So I was just using the flash on my camera to trigger these. And I hadn't bargained for all these people with triggers on their own cameras, flashes on their own cameras. So they would go in to photograph their friends or family like this and click. And the flash on their cameras would activate <laughs> all these flashes in the ringing of the club. So I had to go around and apologize to all these people whose own photographs were horribly overexposed because of my, um, my big flash construction in the ceiling. And they go, oh my God, that's a great camera. It only cost me 10 quid from Boots, incredibly powerful. Look at the flash you get from it. Here you see a couple of the flash units a bit more clearly up at the top. Um, so the other, the main, one of the central ideas for this public art project was that uh, the book, my own book, my own photographs for Glasgow would uh, be a kind of symbolic gift to everyone in the town, but it would not be commercially available. So it's a kind of critique of the way in which these coffee table books always end up on the coffee tables of English, white, middle-class people like me and not on the coffee tables of the people who are represented in the book. And uh, something about that hierarchy really struck me and I wanted to find a way to make work, documentary work, which was purer somehow in its intention. And I thought, I really have to give this work back to the subject matter. And that's the only way I can really justify making this kind of documentary practice. And so um, I, I put in the budget, I said it's going to cost about £14,000 to deliver 8,000 copies of my book, each to every home in the whole of Port Glasgow. And they agreed that budget. And um, but about halfway through the project, I realised that it was a mistake to give £14,000 effectively to Royal Mail and it would be much better if those funds went straight back into the community somehow. So I talked to the manager of the local boys football team and I said 
well, if you can deliver all the books, there's about 100 kids in this football team because they're all ages. If you can get all the books delivered to all 8,000 homes in the whole of Port Glasgow, I can give you the 14,000 pounds. So I went back to the council who were holding the purse strings for the project. I said, I've got this great idea, that money that we budgeted to give to Royal Mail, we'll give it to the local kids football team. And they could really benefit from that. You know, they can use it for trips abroad, to buy a new football kit. And it fits with the ethics and the ethos of the project, which is about finding ways in which you can use photography to serve the subject matter or benefit them in some way. So first off, the local council said, no, what would happen if one of these kids gets bitten or attacked by a dog or attacked by someone? And, and I said, it's much less likely that these kids who are delivering to their aunties and uncles and friends and families, schoolmates, are going to get attacked than a team of outside delivery people. And so eventually they, after I wrote to the local MP, they gave in and agreed to it. And they delivered all 8,000 books uh, within a week, I think. Uh, no problems at all. Uh, this is a letter I wrote to the local MP asking for his support to make this happen. And still to this day, I would say it's probably one of the best days of my life when I saw these swarms of kids running over these council estates, chapping on people's doors and handing over a free copy of the book. Because people's faces, you know, they didn't know what to, what to make of it. You know, they were like, you from the Mormons? Uh, do you want money? Um, what do you want from me? And it's actually quite a, you know, it's quite a shocking thing to get something for free without any expectation. So, this is one of the many emails I received that's on screen at the moment, which kind of reveals that surprise um, and confusion about what my intentions are by delivering this free book. And of course, many people liked it, but many people as well didn't like it. Um, and um, those responses were documented and rejoiced in the local newspaper, the Greenock Telegraph, for about a month afterwards. So uh, this is one of the first articles after the book was delivered. Uh, this is Betty who's on the front cover here saying she loves it. I look through it every night. I know a lot of people in it. I can't get over how good the photos are. Um, but a lot of people didn't like the book as well. Um, and as, as is always the way, you know, um, art divides people. And, is somehow confrontational in some ways, isn't it? So Claire thinks that I'm an outsider looking in with a prejudiced view before I started. Uh, we are a real community, real people with feelings. We have to live here when this lens is gone. This is the manager of the local boys football team who benefited to the tune of about 14,000 pounds, but still he can't bring himself to fully endorse it. Um, uh, the most extreme reaction I had was this. So all the, all the uh, residents of one particular street, Robert Street in Port Glasgow, got together and they had a street meeting and they decided, it, this is a very Protestant street, they decided to dump their copies of the book at the back of a Catholic club, this club, and set fire to them because they felt there were too many pictures taken in Protestant pubs and clubs and churches and not enough pictures in the book taken in Catholic pubs and clubs and churches. No, sorry, the other way. They thought there were too many pictures taken in Catholic pubs and clubs and churches and not enough pictures taken in Protestant pubs and clubs and churches. So, I mean, uh, I went through the book afterwards and I think there are nine pictures taken in Catholic pubs and clubs and seven in Protestant pubs and clubs, but that slight imbalance was uh, enough to cause this book dumping and book burning. So they set fire to these books at the back of the Catholic club and I got a call from the fire brigade saying your books are on fire Mr Neville and uh, yeah so at the time I was quite upset about it <coughs> because I wanted everyone to love the project but um, um, now I'm, I think it's a quite interesting gauge of kind of reaction to public artwork. And it kind of reveals sectarian, sorry, excuse me, sectarian tensions. Uh, 
Um, I also in included a questionnaire in the book which encouraged people to respond. So I asked these questionnaires to be returned to the local town hall. Um, here we go, a total waste of time and money. A first year student could have done a lot better. Um, so anyway, I delivered the project um, and then um, I kind of did nothing for a month or two. And slowly but surely, people started to hear about this project, people in the art world, if you like. Now, I really had no contact with the art world for about a year or two um, when I made this project. All I did was make the project and, and, and that was it and deliver it. And uh, I started to get invitations to exhibit the show and um, invitations from curators asking for a copy of the book. And I said, I can't give you a copy of the book. It was given, you know, it was given exclusively to 8,000 homes in Port Glasgow. It's not commercially available. It's not for you. And of course, that made the curators in the art world want it even more because it's human nature, isn't it, to want something that you can't get. So after about a year, I decided to acquiesce and slowly drip feed elements of the exhibition and the projects into an exhibition format, if you like, into a white cube context. So this is the first manifestation of that, which is at the uh, Modern Art Oxford Museum uh, in a group show called Local Stories with Gillian Waring and some other artists who are exploring the idea of community. And in the exhibition, I didn't just include you know, big prints from the exhibition. I also included all that wealth of community response that I received. I included new interviews with people from Port Glasgow. A large percentage of any sales of work went back to charities in Port Glasgow. Um, so this was the only way I could think about giving people in Port Glasgow a voice again within the gallery context. But the strangest thing that happened in a way was the book started to become very valuable. So I started to see it on eBay selling up for selling for up to about five, six hundred dollars. So uh, which I was delighted about, of course, because people who had a copy of the book and weren't interested in photography, and weren't interested in art, they could just put their book online and make some money out of it. So it had a direct economic benefit for that working class community in Port Glasgow. Uh, and of course, it made the people who had burnt their copies of the book even more angry, which delighted me. So um, conceptually, it kind of fitted into the whole ethos of the project in a way that photography should always think about its role, its social role. How can, how can it actively, because it deals with reality, it has to find a way to change things. So I'm going to talk about war and conflict now in two projects, one in Af uh, Helmand, Afghanistan, and the next in Ukraine. Um, how are we doing for time? Not, not long left, actually. Um, so I will fast forward from 2003, four when I made the Port Glasgow project to Helmand, Afghanistan. So I got an invitation from the Imperial War Museum to go there as an official war artist. I'd never been to a war zone before and I stupidly accepted. Um, so from going to interview with three or four other artists to being accepted to be a war artist to actually going out there, I think I had a month to prepare. This was in 2010, 10 years ago. Uh, so my interviews were concluded in November and in early December, I was on a plane with 200 soldiers on a Hercules flying out to frontline Afghanistan. This was the kit I took with me. So it includes high speed film cameras, movie cameras, stills cameras, flash equipment, cables. And I was personally responsible for getting all this kit on and off helicopters every other day for about three months in a war zone. And so I would just grab people and say, you've got to fucking help me get this kit on and off this helicopter now, please help. And I'd arrive somewhere new and try and find a way to store it and use it in a kind of effective way. I'm going to talk quite briefly about this so I can get on to parade, but um, effectively I shot on a plate camera and one of the things that shocked me the most was this, was how young people were. So not just the local population, uh, but also uh, 
the truth. So these guys, you know, you're meant to be 18 to serve on the front lines in, in Helmand, Afghanistan or anywhere, but they all look like kids to me. I mean, 13, 14 years old or something. It seemed to me, I'm sure they're not. Um, and again, you know, the use of people. So I was out on patrol quite regularly and it's quite frightening being on patrol. So you, you're in a line of soldiers and there's a distance about two meters between yourself and the soldier behind you and the soldier in front of you. And you have to maintain that distance. And there's a guy at the front with a metal detector searching for mines. And you know you can't step left or right because you might step on a mine. And if you do that, you endanger not only your own life, but the life of the person behind you and in front of you. And so it's a very confined uh, remit for taking photographs and also extremely stressful one. And you're in full body armor too and carrying a lot of heavy camera equipment. But one of the most shocking things is these kids will come out of nowhere in just ones or twos or threes totally unaccompanied by any other adults and you can't see anything for miles and they'll just appear like apparitions. Um, so um, the other very strange thing about that experience was the friends that you make. So um, it's such an intense experience when you're uh, being shot at uh, and hearing bombs going off night and day that you make friendships very, very quickly and for, for life as well. And I never had that particular kind of bonding experience before in that, in that way. Um, and this is me with a friend of mine, Mike, who uh, died last year. Um, and he, like all of us, really struggled with the whole war experience. And he'd done several tours, not just Afghanistan, but also Iraq. And when he came back, he decided to become a professional wrestler. And he couldn't see any connection between this kind of Greek theatrical manifestation of fighting and the real fighting that he'd done before. But for me, it's clearly some kind of cathartic thing. And um, I totally understood it because I suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder when I came back from Afghanistan. And um, it took me about six months to admit I had it. Um, constant nightmares, flashbacks, um, and also my behavior changed as well, uh, quite drastically. Uh, became extremely confrontational um, and lots of other things too. So I did get treated. And I'm pleased to say I'm okay now, but it was a process, it was a journey, and I wanted something good to come from that. So I thought, well, I'm going to make a book, and I'm going to call it Battle Against Stigma, and I'm really going to use it to try and encourage troops who are, veteran, who are veterans and troops who are suffering from PTSD to come forward and seek help, because if it, I found it difficult to come forward and get help, then of course, if you're uh, someone who's been told to man up all their lives, then you're going to find it doubly difficult. So, um, so I wrote a book uh, about my own struggle with PTSD when I came back, my whole war experience and how difficult it was to adjust when I came back. And I also included many stories from troops about their own journey with PTSD and specifically veterans who used to think that PTSD didn't exist, but now they know it does exist because they've suffered from it and their friends have suffered from it. And um, I went to the Ministry of Defence and I said, I've got this great idea for a book. It's not about criticising the Ministry of Defence. It's not about pointing the finger. The only thing I'm interested in doing is getting this book out to troops to encourage them to come forward and seek professional help. Because it's not possible to go to a war zone for any length of time and come back unaffected. It's not possible. It's like putting a cat in the field and letting bombs off around it all day. The cat might survive, but it won't be the same animal anymore. And it's the same with people. It's very simple. So I made the book um, and I didn't make the book. I went to the Ministry of Defence and said, I want to make this book. Will you support it? Will you, will you 
you know, you can write a chapter in it. You can do whatever you want. You can put your stamp on it. The only thing I'm interested in doing is helping troops. And first off, they were very excited and very positive. And then I had another meeting with them and they changed their minds. And they said, we don't want you to reproduce your pictures taken in Helmand, Afghanistan, alongside these stories about PTSD, because it will imply that everyone you photographed has PTSD. And I said, well, I won't do that. You know, I know how to structure a book. I promise you, you know, I've been nominated for Pulitzer, blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, we absolutely forbid you to reproduce your stories about PTSD alongside your pictures in the same book. So I said, okay, I promise not to reproduce them in the same book. So this was my kind of fuck you to the Ministry of Defense. So I made one volume of, um, of my photographs taken in Helmand, Afghanistan, along with my own account of my own struggle with PTSD when I came back. And I made another volume, which was the accounts from the troops. And I had them printed in Spain with a company called Grafos who made great slip cases. And they were printed in 2015 and they came, uh, the first consignment, they were printed in an edition of 1500. So the first edition of 500 was seized by UK border force in 2015. And I called them up and I said, I understand you're holding this consignment of books. And they said, yep. And I said, can I have them back please? And they said, no. And to this day, I haven't got them back. Luckily, a second consignment of books Battle Against Stigma came via a different route and arrived safely in my studio. And I, then I furiously spent all of summer 2015 delivering these books to mental health charities, um, homeless centres, prisons, prison libraries. I did a tour of prison libraries throughout Britain, um, trying to get to those veterans who have slipped through the cracks, you know, because what happens is when you get PTSD, you end up self-medicating, drinking, you become violent, you lose your job, you lose your family, and you become, you know, a lost statistic, basically. So I thought getting these books out to these people was the only way that I could reach them was through the mental health charities, through the homeless centres, through the prisons. Um, and I was furiously trying to get these books out before the... UK border force uh, came knocking on my door wanting this consignment of books as well. Uh, I also wrote about uh, my, my journey with PTSD and this book in the Independent online. And I put the end of my article, uh, if you're suffering from PTSD or a friend or a family member is suffering, please get in touch with me on info at markneville.com and I will send you a free copy of the book. And as soon as that went online, in May 2015, I got an email every 10 minutes from a veteran or the mother of a veteran or the father of a veteran or some relation saying, please post me a copy of the book. Not only asking for a copy of the book, but going into incredible detail about what happened to them when they came back to Britain and the lack of support. Um, and basically thousands of emails going into extreme personal detail about their journey with PTSD. Um, so of all the book projects I've done, and I've done about six now, I guess, which have had a targeted dissemination, this is the one that's had the most tangible effect because I see that I tapped into some real ostensible um, hidden pain, you know, a problem, a real problem. Um, so I'm gonna go from that very quickly into Ukraine, uh, but I'm gonna skip through this bit rather quickly. So my next book, which is due for publication this summer is called Stop Tanks With Books. It's all about my work in Ukraine over the past four years. Um, and ostensibly, we're going to try and stop the war in eastern Ukraine uh, with this book. It's 
being sent out to politicians worldwide, to people involved in the Minsk agreements. Um, and Steidl are not only publishing this book, um, they're actually helping me disseminate this book as well, which I think is the first time that Steidl has ever done that, but they have totally endorsed my model um, and believe in it and believe that books can change society and should change society. And people shouldn't have to pay for them in that respect. These are pictures taken of some of the 2 million people who have been displaced by the war in Ukraine. Um, it's one of the biggest displacement of people in the world at the moment. And the fighting goes on every day. I've been to all parts of Ukraine. I've been to the east where the fighting is going on. I've been to Chernobyl. I've been to the west. This is Kiev Lavra Church. Um, uh, I'm very keen on this image because it makes kind of connections between the church and mafia somehow. Although I'm not religious and I'm not a member of the mafia either, but um, I think it has a kind of potency. These images were taken for the New York Times. They're uh, about Odessa, this amazing resort in Ukraine. So the book itself um, contains essays, it contains sociological research into the war zone there, uh, but also contains elements like this, which are about life continuing. And as we know, no matter what happens, people People want life to continue, continue somehow, don't we? Despite everything. Coming to the end of these now. So um, this brings me to uh, Parade, which is the project, the book, if essentially, which has been nominated for the Deutsche Bourse Foundation Photography Award 2020. And um, it's a project I made over three, three to four years in a small town in Brittany called Gangong, which sounds almost Chinese, doesn't it? Or Oriental, certainly not French, but it is French and it's spelled G-U-I-N-G-A-M-P. Um, and I started it the day that we voted to leave the European Union. So uh, I um, was opening an exhibition there at a place called Gwinzigal Art Centre in Gangon. And it was a show with Tom Woods and Chris Killip uh, uh, called British Subjects. And as neither Tom nor Chris could make it, um, I was in really encouraged to attend the opening. And uh, they were showing my Port Glasgow book project, which I talked about at the start of this discussion. And um, effectively, they, uh, it was the very day that we'd voted to leave the, the European Union. So I was in shock. I was in France in a small town. And as is the want of many a French opening exhibition, they wanted people to come up and deliver speeches at the start of the opening. So I had to stand up in front of two or 300 people and the town mayor and say, I'm ashamed, you know, j'ai honte. And I was ashamed to be British um, on that particular day and on many days, but on that particular day, I was really ashamed. And I tried to explain that uh, leaving Europe wasn't everyone's wish uh, and, and it certainly wasn't mine. So for me, the book Parade uh, has a kind of emotional connection with Brexit um, and it was a kind of way for me to uh, cathartically explore all those, all, those, all those feelings I had by looking at a mirroring situation. So I was looking for, in a sense, a, a kind of British identity through the lens of a French town and in fact the origins of Brittany are, are British uh, and um, there are so many connections I seem to be able to make uh, about this search for what community means. 
Uh, the most amazing thing that really struck me were, though was this kind of relationship people had developed between themselves and animals. So there's a very big farming community there. Uh, I think there's about six million pigs and only three million people in Brittany. And one of the first people I met was um, Melinda, who she worked in a refuge for animals for 15 years. One day she went into work and just said, I can't do this anymore. It just disgusts me. And she left. And after that point, she spent her whole life just looking after animals. So anyone in the area can't, can choose to actually uh, leave their disabled animal. It might be a, you know, a, a blind dog or it might be a, um, some kind of disabled hamster or a, a, a pony with problems. They can leave their animal with Melinda. And she will look after them on her property. So you go there and it's full of hamsters and doves flying through the kitchen. And it's just this amazing kind of Noah's Ark of animals. And it's really moving. It's really touching. And this was taken on her property. And I met many people who developed these really unconventional relationships with, with animals. And there was a real sense, sense in which there's a kind of search for ecotopia. Now, ecotopia is a term that comes from a a 1970s author called Ernest Callenbach, who was in California. And he was a kind of poster boy for uh, the eco generation there in California at the time. He came up with some wonderful thoughts and ideas about how an ecotopia could work. And it's all based, of course, about our relationship with nature. Um, the other kind of manifestation of community comes through Breton identity. So of course they have the Breton language there as well as French. And these are some of the signposts that you see have been taken down, which feature both a Breton and a French, French language signposting. What I try to do as well, because I, you know, I, I saw this as a kind of therapeutic journey for myself. So I was thinking ostensibly about the images themselves rather than who the end target audience would be when I first started on this project. And so I wanted the images to have a kind of multi-layered feeling about them. Um, this is Jean Rock, who is a kind of horse whisperer. So he works with horses and their owners. And there are horses who have been abused or frightened in some way. And he'll really work hard to make them feel more comfortable, both the horse with the owner and the owner with the horse. And one of the things he does is trains them to stand on cars, well, this car specifically, in order to develop a kind of trust and relationship. And when you, when you can get them to do that, he knows that he's established some kind of bond with them. This is Breton dancing, another major manifestation of, 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 of community identity. Some of the images are constructed in the sense that I spent quite a lot of time going back to the same people and places and talking to them, trying to figure out where and how I wanted to photograph them. Other pictures are taken much more uh, dynamically or fluidly, if you like. So this one's taken at 10 in the morning, I think, about coming out of the supermarket. And I did ask him if I could take his picture a couple of times and he said, no problem. These guys are walking down the street around the corner. And again, I'm thinking about a wealth of different types of references going on. So with this, I th think I had in mind a French New Wave movie from 1967. Um, other images, you know, I had in my mind sometimes Flemish painting. So I think this one really references the color palette of a, and the postures of a Flemish painting. They also have a very big football team very small football team, but a very successful football team in Gangor, who are a kind of David and Goliath figure, you know, they're mighty beyond their means. And you find that everyone you talk to there is a Gangon supporter. Um, so uh, when it came to doing the exhibition of the work, we decided to uh, do the exhibition, the main exhibition for the work, actually in the passerelle leading up to the football stadium in Gangon itself. So something like 20,000 people pass these billboards where my, where my pictures are, 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 are hooked up onto every football match. So that's every second Saturday, there's an audience of 20,000 people. And the majority of those people are the farming community. 
So it was a very uh, successful way for me to deliver the images back to the community again in the same spirit of the Port Glasgow project where I delivered the books. Um, this is Lucy who posed for one of the images. Um, so something, there's something like 60 of the images were printed to a size of about two meters each. And during a match day, this whole pavement area is full of people. Again, I mean, you kind of see that this is the same farmer, you know, I go back to the same farmers again and again, and just try and feel and sense how we could come up with a portrait in a certain, certain location, which would have some kind of longevity. I wanted to read to you a passage which uh, Will Self has written for the excellent catalogue that the Photographer's Gallery produced for this. So he says in his piece on parade, no one wakes up in the morning and at the moment of coming to consciousness finds that their essence is to be British or French or Breton. No, rather we have a few seconds or minutes during which our sense of ourselves is as purely inchoate as it's ever been. We are all potential, nothing actually, before we relapse into the nagging claims of wanting flesh. Sometime after that, we go, we get up, go to the loo, and then peering into the bathroom mirror, notice that we put on our British mask, our French or Breton mask. Here, in the details of Neville's images, we find <clears throat> the devils that plague us all nowadays. The animals whose relationship to women and men is no longer productive or symbiotic, but largely, largely hieratic. The hounds that cluster behind the girl may be a working pack, but their work consists in a leisure activity, which is itself a skiomorph, namely the reconfiguring of something or pursuit formerly utile as merely decorative. The dogs clustered behind the girl, walking on water perhaps, or at any rate, some unseen bridge or pontoon. Their role is perhaps to act as her spiritual advisors, reminding her of the skull beneath every skin. And elsewhere, horses stand on cars or are ridden by dogs, while fish are held in the manner of scepters and orbs. A poultry worker becomes but the figure in a carpet of wings and beaks. A huntsman seems more concerned to keep his range immaculate than track down his quarry. The presence of animals in Neville's images reminds us of this different sort of derobe, the painful retreat of humanity from the ambit of the natural, which is circumscribed now by the screen. Whereas once upon a time, the animals were everywhere, including in the basilica, they might well have been regarded through a hatred scope. So I'm going to finish talking now. Um, I'm going to talk about this image and about the book, which I, I co-produced um, alongside the publication Parade specifically for uh, the Deutsche Borse exhibition. It's called Parade Texts um, and it's free. Um, and it's being sent out to schools, community centres, libraries, uh, politicians, ministries of agriculture and food, not only in the UK, but also in France. It's in two languages. So you flip it over, it's in French, flip it over, it's in English. And it's interviews with Brittany farmers. And it's all about this need for access to land in order to produce sustainable produce. So at the moment, the big uh, industrial companies are basically, as we know, industrializing food production so that the land is being completely decimated and also uh, the produce is substandard now. So we need to encourage uh, subsidies, government subsidies for small, sustainable local farming. That's the only way forward. So there's a call to action in the book um, and it's pearls of wisdom from farmers who have done this all their lives in Brittany. 
work with small plots of land and produce sustainable produce. Um, and it's also downloadable from my website. And it was made also in collaboration with an organization called Access to Land Network. Um, and it's also free from the exhibition at the Photographer's Gallery, which we're hoping very much will continue um, once this is all over with the virus. Um, so I'm going to finish just by talking about this one image with the girls with the dog, the girl with the dogs, because it seems to have resonated with people. So basically, this was a girl that I met doing, uh, she was doing baton twirling, uh, which is a big, big sport. It's a big um, community manifestation in Gangon. And uh, she has these most amazing striking eyes. And I asked her if she would pose for me uh, in a, in a, for a portrait. And at about the same time, I met this guy who breeds, bull, uh, breeds hunting dogs, not for sport. So they're not actually used for hunting anymore, but he just loves them as a breed. And I went to his land and they had, they had this amazing kind of false lake with a, with a jetty going out into it. And um, yeah, so it took about three days to, to get this one image. And there are many interesting images from that particular shoot, but this one is far and away the strongest. Um, and I think it's because it looks like it should be a collage. It looks like it shouldn't be happening. Um, so that's a common question is people ask me if it's Photoshop or collage and it's not. And we know intuitively somehow that it's not Photoshop um, because of course, we're very sophisticated at looking at images. And I think um, it's that kind of tension between something which is clearly orchestrated. It seems that the, the author of the, the work, me, has set it up somehow. But there's also another tension in that it's a real moment happening. And I think that the best documentary images do have, always have a sense of something about them which is ordered and constructed, but also something, some element of real chance, which is, um, which is beautiful. And it's a tension between the two, which makes the image work. Thank you. I'd like to take some questions now, if, if you're out there. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? I hope that that's working now. Thank you so much, Mark, for this really wonderful and generous overview. Um, that was brilliant. And um, just to remind everyone, um, you can now ask your questions and you can either do that by raising your hand and then you we will spotlight you and then you can ask your question yourself or um, you can just um, put them in the chat and I'll read them out to Mark. Um, for answering. And um, while you were talking, Mark, we already received quite a few questions. So um, um, maybe one um, that you can answer first. How has the parade project been received by the people from the area in which it was made? And more generally, um, how, what does community mean to you? Um, obviously, of, of, a lot of your projects are kind of based around that theme. So can you talk a little bit more um, about what it means to you? Um, well, I, you know, the, the, the great thing about parade was that it was exhibited at the football stadium. And that, of course, was the most direct, most beautiful way to get a, a big exhibition to a whole town which is obsessed with football. So um, much in the same way that Port Glasgow have been delivered to the community there through football, through the local boys football team, somehow football played the part of, of making, uh, making that dissemination of the work happen in Gangon too. Um, so there were these kind of connections going on. So I was delighted that we managed to get the work exhibited that way. The second dissemination, which is um, kind of for, I guess, the people of Gango in the way that more conventional exhibitions isn't, is the delivery of the book. So this book of text parades, which is being sent out actually with the book itself to several hundred recipients, including ministries of food and agriculture, local food, farms and uh, local schools and community centers. So this went out just before uh, the virus hit. So it's been very difficult to um, follow up on that in a fair way, I think, because everyone's coping with just getting by at the moment. But I think the thing to do is for me to follow up on kind of feedback and response to that book. 
in two or three months time and see if we can galvanize the conversation again because i do think that hopefully through the virus there will be some kind of resettling of social values or reassessment of social values so i'm praying that social division doesn't get bigger but it actually gets smaller and there's some kind of assessment of of a way forward and surely part of that way forward is to do with ecology mm. so um, i'm hoping that in a few months time i can regalvanize those arguments and, and and in terms of my own relationship with community i've been thinking about this from a kind of psychological perspective over the past couple of years that why do i make these projects because it's not a conventional life and it's something to do with a search for family. So it's, it's somehow, I go to a community and I'll be really embedded there for a year or two sometimes, sometimes less, but sometimes a year or two. And somehow I'm looking to be accepted into that family, mm. into that community. And of course I'm not part of the British army. So I'm not really totally accepted into that family. And then I'm not really part of the, Scottish working class community on the west coast of Scotland either and I'm not part of the Pittsburgh community where I did a project for the Warhol so it never really entirely succeeds and then you go on to the, <laughs> the next search for family and then someone else said you know if you take a lot of pictures of kids in your pictures and quite often in war zones or they're undergoing some hardship and what you're actually doing is you're you'll try I mean I don't want to overemphasize this I'm quite happy with my life thank you but you're trying to put a spotlight on 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 things that happened to you as a kid because no no one <laughs> no one could witness them so that's what you're that's what a psychologist would say i'm doing um so there are lots of ways of looking at it um but community i don't know it's interesting how community man will manifest itself over the next couple of months what i'm hoping will happen is that that community manifestation will will realize in a more equal society. Don't we all want that? I think so. Um, another one just that you mentioned the current situation with the virus and everything happening. Um, another question was, do you, um, do you think do you think things will change or will your approach to photography um, change after all of this is over and do you, are you continuously making photographs while this is happening while this is going on well almost all my photographs are of people i think i've only ever taken two pictures of land what you call landscape or still life in 20 years so um it's very difficult for me to take photographs. Before the virus hit, I was taking, I was making a project, a new book about social housing in London and the need for more affordable housing in London. And of course, that's impossible. I can't go around housing estates knocking on people's door, doors at the moment. And I also, part of me, I have to say, think it's slightly irresponsible for if and when photographers go out taking pictures in this lockdown in the current situation because i've actually had covid i've had the virus for three weeks now so it was really bad during the first week uh, i stayed at home throughout it um, i'm fine now but i i'm aware i still have it um, and if i'd have started going out and taking pictures instead of staying at home i could easily have been disseminating my mm. My, my sickness to other people. So I'm in no hurry to go out now and take pictures in this condition. Um, and I'm also quite wary of doing it in the future. I think it's gotta be, it's gotta be kind of respectful, hasn't it? Um, so I have no idea how my work will, mm. will develop in this situation. I've been writing quite a lot about the experience of being sick and coming up with other ideas for work, but I'm not really, ready to share either experience yet. Um, so another project is about when you start a project, do you know where you want to end up? Do, or do you, like, do, you, do you change throughout the process while you meet the community or the people that you are exposed to? Or do you kind of set out and you know what you want to, to depict? 
normally what happens is ideally I have I identify three questions. The first question is, what do I really want to make money? Work, make money. Make, I really want to make money. What do I really want to make work about? You know, because um, to do a project takes an enormous amount of juice and energy, and my projects take a year, two years, three years. I mean, here I am now, ten years later, still engaged with issues to do with PTSD in my work, battle against stigma. You know, I still ask to do talks about battle against stigma for the NHS. Um, so these projects have a have a long life. So it's really got to be something you really believe in. So mm. the first thing is, it sounds stupid, but actually it's quite difficult to know what you what's really going to sustain you in terms of subject matter and interest. So you've got to identify who what it is you want want to make work about. So it might be a demographic. It might be a group of people. It might be. Um, a particular issue to do with social documentary practice. It might be a place that inspires you. It might be some aspect of society. But you've got to identify what that is first. Then you've got to think, what can I do that's really going to help be of use here? You know, how can work, what I produce, really have some kind of social value as opposed to just being pictures on the wall or in the newspaper? And there's nothing wrong with those contexts, but I think it's the responsibility of photographers and artists to really think about how their work can really honestly do some good. Because if we don't do some good, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, basically. So we've got a real responsibility to use whatever platform we have to make that happen. And it's about chipping away at things. Mm. You might think it makes no difference, but it does. And enough people chip away, then things do change, actually. Um, so it's about, you know, it's really deciding, being honest with yourself about what it is you want to make work about, how people are going to benefit from it. Should they get a copy of the book? Who should get a copy of the book? Should it be MPs? Should it be every single local council in the whole of the UK? Should it people who be people who live in a specific town? Who's the audience for the work? And then the next phase is fundraising. How on earth are you going to find the money? To make this happen and then it's you've got to have a very tight schedule of like work where you know you've got to throw yourself into it and that might involve me living in afghanistan with the british army for three months or it might involve me moving to pittsburgh for a year like i did or whatever it you know and then um so it's kind of those phases it's not always like that you know exceptions parade i really didn't know what the work was about until i was halfway through it I mean, on many levels, it's about a mirroring of Britain through Brittany. Um, and that was the initial impulse. But I think it became more about this ecological theme and the relationship between people and animals. And, and that's what came through strongest for me when I was actually making the work. So um, one question came up, how do you finance your projects? Because they're quite long term projects as well. So how do you go about that? Um, well, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's not getting it any easier and it won't get any easier. Um, uh, I try everything. So I'm totally focused on applying for grants. Um, that's been in the past, that's been from the Wellcome Trust who funded my project Deeds Not Words, which exhibited at the Photographer's Gallery seven years ago. Um, that was about a toxic waste court case in Corby. Wellcome Trust also funded a project I did called Battle Against Stigma, which was the, the war project about PTSD. Um, other funders have included the Arts Council of England. Um, uh, I put every penny I make, it just goes back into the work. So I don't have my own, I don't, you know, I don't own a house. I don't own a car. I rent this place. I don't have a family to support. So everything I make goes back into this journey I have with photography and, and the work. Um, I write to, uh, you know, uh, philanthropists, charities, people who are involved, involved with the kind of central cause of the, the book or the project. And I do a lot of research. And when I get funding from one body, I go on to the next until I think I've got enough to make, make something happen. 
There was a question about um, the background of your project and your relationships with the subjects and people in the photographs of your Ukrainian um, project. Um, what was your idea here? Was it um, like, did you emerge in the everyday life um, or what was your approach? Well, Ukraine has been particularly difficult to fund because I, I, I you know, it's, 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 it's a massive displacement. There's a war there, but um, it's something that's rarely reported on now in the news. You rarely hear about it. Um, so it's been very difficult to find funding for. So what I've done is try to be as creative as possible whenever I've uh, had an opportunity to go there or convince somebody that I should be sent there, I've taken it. So for example, when the New York Times asked me to uh, do a, a series for their voyages issue about people on holiday, uh, they said, where do you want to go? I immediately said Odessa in Ukraine because um, I wanted it to contribute to this body of work I'm doing called Stop Tanks with Books, which is being published by Steidl. So even then, that was in 2017, I knew that those pictures I took from New York Times would ultimately be in this book, Stop Tanks with Books. Um, and so that was one way in which I could legitimately get um, a newspaper to fund the trip. My, my, you know, me working film, which I do, so I have the film developed, processed, film stock bought, my expenses, and I could shoot in Ukraine for two weeks. Mm. Um, and they were delighted with the pictures. And uh, obviously, because I, I knew they were going to be in the book, I, I put everything into them. So um, it's about being, for that, it was about being creative. And in a sense, that creativity has determined uh, the kind of work that I've done there. So, you know, it's produced the images in Odessa. I did another short project about the Roma community in, in Uskorod, which is on the Hungarian border with Ukraine. Um, I've been uh, also supported by the Center for Eastern European Studies in uh, Berlin, who um, are doing a lot of really important research into displacement in Eastern Ukraine and who the displaced are, what their political views are, what their experiences have been. So I spent several months in the East near the front line interviewing people who'd lost their homes, who'd seen people blown up, de decapitated, you know, lost everything. And I tell you, it was really remarkable. The Ukrainian people are extremely strong. Um, not once did anybody ask me for anything. You know, they've got nothing, absolutely nothing from these people. And they would sit down, make me a cup of tea and just tell me what happened to them. And I don't think I've ever experienced that before. I've been to some terrible, horrific places before and seen terrible misery. But in Ukraine, my gosh, real pride, really impressive. Yeah. That uh, yeah, I think so. I think, um, and then I think there's maybe time for for one more question, um, and that's a little bit about your style and your photographic style. And and there was a lot of questions around um, your use of um, flashlight and almost overexposure of your images. Could you talk a little bit about how you came about that style and why you sometimes use color and sometimes black and white images? One. Okay, well, I've, I've actually um, got my camera here. So this is, this is one camera that I use, and it's a medium format film camera. So um, you'll see I've got the flash on the side here, because if you have the flash on top of the camera, it flattens the whole image. If you have the flash at the side, you actually get nicer shadows under the neck and under the nose, and it has a more painterly feel to it. So I kind of developed this rig myself. And it's one that I use when I can't go, when I know I can go somewhere and I'm gonna to have to just be on the move. I can't store flashlights in the rigging of a club or something like that. When I'm on the move, this is what I'm like, like this, and then, So um, I just knew I wanted to shoot on film. I knew that I wanted my pictures to have a certain depth of feel to them, I think. So I've, I've always been interested in as much detail as possible. And I think that's important if you're doing documentary work because it's, it's important to know 
you know, what surfaces look like, how people have painted their fingernails, the, the design of a glass on a bar, you know. And um, so for me, getting that big depth of field that you see in, in most of my shots is about trying to reveal detail. Um, and I guess it's also, it's also about trying to reference all the images in my head. So like all of us, I draw on these images continuously and they come from painting, they come from cinema, they come from uh, design. And um, it's almost about trying to see that kind of library of images in my head in real life somehow and, uh, and, and manifest those projections somehow. And I think some Im images I just see in black and white, some I see in color. Um, sometimes I'll be trying to reference a particular image um, from the 1960s, for example, um, by some of the, you know, great photographers like Mitch Epstein or Gary Winogrand or, and the most effective way I can make that reference is through lighting. So I'll use lighting, which echoes lighting from a Mitch Epstein picture or a Gary Winogrand picture in order to make those references. And quite often it's to say that actually, you know, I did a whole series called Here is London about wealth inequality in London. I did another series uh, in Pittsburgh called Braddock's or Wickley. And both those series were made uh, in a style very similar to iconic uh, photographers from the 70s and the 80s from America and Britain who are also making work about boom and bust politics and the effects of it on society. And I was making those references in order to say, well, look, things haven't changed. We still got the same social inequalities we had in the seventies and racial inequality. In fact, they're not, they're not better, they're worse in fact. Um, so that was the kind of, those are the kind of thought processes behind me mm. making the images in that way, I guess. Well, there's one more question. Um, one person wanted to ask about the idea of the book changing the world and um, saying that we hear this discussion of images and photojournalism, but this is less possible in the saturated world of an image world. How does the book of images changes this conversation and um, how can you negotiate additional level of authorship when combining um, subjective kind of ways of captivating points of view and um, your own knowledge as well? Sorry, what's that last bit? How can you convey? So, um, what we know as subjective as as captivating as book as, or as seen as a point of knowledge. So this kind of idea um, of something more subjective in there as well. So do you feel how can the book kind of change change the world in some ways in this oversaturated world of images? Well, I mean, by its very nature, you know, you've answered the question there that the book is is something different from an image on a screen, you know. So it's it's quite something to get a free copy of this, especially like seven years ago when this first came out. And it's lying on people's tables, you know, and that's the amazing thing. So, you know, I did a talk in Hong Kong a couple of years ago. And someone from Port Glasgow was in the audience. He came up with his copy of the book, which had actually been delivered to him by the local boys football team in 2003. And it just shows, you know, he brought it all the way to, to Hong Kong with him. <laughs> and then he'd seen that I was doing a talk and he came up and asked me to sign it. So but this, this will have a life. You know, if I put something on a computer screen, it will not. Um, but it's also about production values that people are, you know, if you, even this, I mean, it's, it's a very simple book, but it's, it's beautifully made and people are, are less likely to throw this away than a PDF. You know, you can slip it in your pocket. Um, it's very difficult to ignore a photo book. And if the images are, you know, I think if my images were weak, I don't think I'd have had a career. So it's all right to have a good concept. In fact, it's really important, but somehow the images have got to work really hard as well. Otherwise people just will not engage with what you're trying to say. The hope is that you make images which really, you know, break through that somehow. So, I mean, with this, you know, it's not, it's not really a wildlife photograph. It's not really social documentary. It's not fashion. It's not trying to sell you anything. 
and once you get beyond those, it's not this, it's not that, it's not, then you start to understand that it's working for different ideas somehow. And then you try and find out what those ideas are. But it's getting the viewer to the point where they, they've, they've ruled out the role of the image in all these different other areas and then think, well, let's try and do something else somehow. What is it? What is it that it's trying to do? Um, so I think that the images and by extension the book have to somehow, I mean, also with the Port Glasgow project, like this image here somehow, somehow encapsulates all the themes of celebration which the Port Glasgow book project was about. It was about celebrating community. It was about saying the community of Port Glasgow is really powerful. And somehow the themes and the ethos and the ethics of the whole project are encapsulated in one image. And I think with each book, you've got to try and find at least two or three images, or well, hopefully all of the images have a role in delivering the messages of the project. That's wonderful. Um, if there are no more questions, I think this is a wonderful place to to end this as well this evening. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for, for being so generous, for sharing these projects with us. It was absolutely fantastic. And, and also for being so flexible. Of course, all of this was planned to play, take place in our gallery. And now it was online in this for new format so that was um yeah absolutely amazing um, um thank, you, Anna. thank you very much and thank you louisa as well you've done great and thank you all of you that that kind of signed in and 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 sat in front of your screen this evening that's been really great and um that you participated so actively in this chat function and for your interest and, and participation thank you so much um if you have 30 seconds after that it would be great if you could just fill in a short online questionnaire which would really help us how we can can improve things as well while we get kind of used to these <laughs> online talks so thank you for that mark thank you also you're doing an instagram takeover on the weekend for us so thank you very much for that and please all check it out um, you can find much more information about further events and online talks online. Thank you so much, Louisa Ulyad, who has um, organized this whole evening, um, which was great. But of course, Mark, um, yeah, it's all, all on you. So um, thank you for your time and, and everything. And everyone, please take good care of yourself and see you around, hopefully sometime back in the gallery whenever this is over, who knows when. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Thanks all for listening. Take care. Take care, everyone.